Welcome viewers and Sitaram to an, another edition of the program, Let's Talk. Indeed, we are very fortunate to have in studio with us Dr. Vishan Bimal, a man of many hats. Dr. Ji, welcome. Today we want to discuss with the outlines of the issues and we'll go to them in detail afterwards. Speaking firstly about Hindu unity, Hindu identity, we'll speak a bit about the thing they call Kali worship. All these things that arose over the years and what has changed from India during the time of our Indianship and then now. And then also we speak a bit about things such as Di Baba and other things which people believe in and practice as Hindus. So Dr. First, we shall start with, let's try and talk about Hindu unity um, and identity. Well, I mean, just looking at Trinidad and Tobago, we see that this, the Hinduism itself has many uh, different sects or schools of thought. Mm -hmm. Um, that exists in harmony. I think I believe there are six schools of um, thought, Philosophy, yeah. right? Um, within Trinidad and Tobago, and uh, most of the diaspora, the Sanatanist uh, way of practicing Hinduism mm -hmm. is the most popular way. But what we also have to look at is, again, the point of where our ancestors came from and what traditions they would have brought. Um, there are certain things specific to our brand of Hinduism in the diaspora that is different from... Uh, present-day India. I'll give you an example, um, and this goes back to language. Um, when indentured laborers had came, now there's a dispute as to which castes had come. The records now show that castes from, uh, the castes that would have come would have been all the castes because mm -hmm. at that point in time in India, there were, famine, there, there were a lot of famine, as well as because it was the start of the Industrial Revolution, most of the Indians would have earned their money through artisan work, whether it be making fabric, jewelry, um, but now that was taken over by machines so they didn't have any jobs. So whatever your profession, you were at a point where you didn't, couldn't earn any more, and a lot of them, they, I mean, some, some were kidnapped as well as some willingly came. Um, so in coming, they would have transplanted a culture into Trinidad, but then not everybody would have, have, have had the education about the Hindu systems mm -hmm. because remember, um, there was a system where certain professions would have propagated certain aspects of the, of the religion and of the tradition. I mean, and there, were, there was one point where the availability of pundits at certain times, because in the Hindu tradition, we would name according to under which constellation you were mm -hmm. born, mm -hmm. as well as the geographical place you were born. Um, and it wasn't available as, as much since that, at least the system of Hinduism wasn't well developed as it is now. It took some time, just like everything else, the culture and everything. And one thing that they had resorted to was naming their children on the days they were born. Now, we know these names on an everyday basis, but people don't realize that that's the significance of it. So in Hindi, Monday is um, Somvar. In Bhojpuri is Somar. So one born or a boy born on Somar was Samaru. And a girl born on Sunday was Sumaria. Itwaria. Right? Yeah. Itwaria is yeah. a girl born mm -hmm. on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, Budhu, one mm -hmm. born on a Wednesday. Wednesday. Suku, one born on a Friday. Mm -hmm. So, and that is typical of Hindus within the Bhojpur region. Because mm -hmm. I remember when I had uh, put on a comment on Facebook on my Caribbean Hindustani page. And I showed that table of Hindi Bhojpuri names and then, well, names for the days of the week and then the names derived from it. A lot of people from that area where our ancestors would have come started commenting, but it's still the same, Seriously. even in the villages, yeah. right? Um, and then some people was like, well, my grandfather's name is so-and-so because he was really born on that very week. Um, so we really have to understand us as Hindus from the diaspora, from the international concept of what is Hindu. Um, it doesn't mean to say we are separate. We are just one form of expression of that one reality. But uh, we need to understand our context within it before we have unity within ourselves as a nation or a nation of Trinidad and Tobago uh, nation or the Hindu community within it. We will be unified in belief, but not among ourselves. There's still a lot of disunity. But the point you make about names, now the Hindu youth would want to be named Buddha. Right. They have their own. So how do we handle these youths who are changing in culture and being exposed to a different kind of culture altogether? Um, we made a point about the education system at one point with respect to that colonial mentality, mm -hmm. right? Um, we also would have to look at how as Hindus, especially the pundits within society, 
would need, just as the education system needs to evolve to cater for mm -hmm. the present day children who are different, obviously, mm -hmm. from the children, because I mean, at the end of the day, they more, have more access to information, information mm -hmm. which they need to process, and we need to help them process. Um, but also changing the way we hand down our Hindu traditions to that generation. Mm -hmm. We need to find out from them what they see themselves as. How do they view themselves? But if you take it, for instance, common sense will dictate us. I'm a parent, I have a child. When a child is born, he doesn't give himself a name. I give him the name. Right. So is it to be blame? You can't blame the youths. You have to blame the parents who are bringing down a different tradition, you said. Yeah, exactly. down the tradition we want to carry down right. to And what I'm speaking about, and that disjoint would have come from the fact that as Hindus and a Hindu community, we didn't really take stock into how we passed that, down that. So, I mean, you would refer to maybe my parents or um, people from my generation, which would we be the inheritors of that culture. Um, and unfortunately, the education system, which is the formal education system which we inherited, was a colonial system, as well as our own education within Hinduism or the Hindu community needs to be reevaluated and, and evolved. Now, if we look at um, the scriptures, right, um, and these are things we should probably look at teaching in school, the, the, the Shruti versus the Smriti, and what is the Smriti, and what is the evidence, and what is the relevance of it, and how thought, Hindu thoughts, would have evolved over eons. That's a very important point. Mm -hmm. And even looking at the Vedas, and how they divide into four books, and how the information from the first division is different from the second division and third division. It also represents the evolution of human thought. Um, Ashwamed, Purushamed, and Gaumed, are mentioned in Rigved. How it was practiced changed from Veda to Veda. How the ritual was practiced and it was dependent on society. In this day and age where we have a system of democracy or a system of where the people vote, or even in a communist system, it does not ascribe to that anymore because you do have kingdoms. So that a Ashwamed, a Purushamed, and a, a Gaumed would make sense in this day and age. So certain things that ascribe to the ritualistic aspect of Hinduism bears no relevance today. Mind you, it doesn't mean it didn't bear relevance in the past. Um, one thing at dispute now is the Marriage Act. And the Marriage Act looked at the fact that, um, uh, especially for the sake of and protection of, of, of women and female mm -hmm. with respect to at what age they should be married at. Now, from a doctor's perspective, a female stands the risk in pregnancy of not succumbing to complications between the ages of 19 to 35. So, scientifically, then that should be the age at which they should fulfill that. But the tradition, uh, according to the research, was that people got married early because they're shortage of male internet? I mean, that's <laughs> one aspect, and I could yeah. go from a linguistic thing, but I mean, you can't just look at the East Indian community. No, you also have to look at the evolution of education and the access for education. At that point in time, education was available, but it was only available for males. Um, once a female reached a particular age, her aspiration towards education wasn't condoned, right? So that her role now would have to be of a householder, right? Mm -hmm. So that because education was, or at least it was some point of discrimination respect to how available it was to the sexes, that was one point of where it had to happen. But even within, at least at that point, the hoi lawyer, the peasant folk, did not aspire towards a certain achievement in education is only, um, let's say, my generation or the generation prior to mine or maybe two generations is only when that upward social mobility started um, mm -hmm. moving forward. When you look at indentureship times, they didn't aspire towards education. So after being a child and being brought up, what was the next thing I had to look for? Marriage. To, to, to be married. And usually that would be in your teenage years, especially in the earlier part But of would the you say year. that we have dropped the cultural battle somewhere along the line? This young generation is going to suffer more and more as you go along the line? Yeah. In future generations will suffer more and more? I think so, because at the end of the day, even the arguing the marriage act and looking at some of the arguments people have for it, mm -hmm. you, you have to understand things in the pros prospect of evolution. I always say, especially whenever I write research papers, is that the ritual always outlived the purpose. And I'll explain that from at least an East Indian perspective. Um, now, I remember growing up, my grandmother saying that, well, you know, you have to sweep before the sun goes down because we have to light the deer, and the deer represents Lakshmi, and Lakshmi is God. So we don't want God to come in a dirty place. That makes sense. Right? <laughs> yeah. 
And that's how it would explain. Yeah. But if you look at the sociological point of view, at the time of when we had Diaz, we didn't have electricity. Um, the security of the house with respect to rodents and, um, and, and, and snakes and scorpions and things like that was much less because we didn't have the access to things like electricity. Um, so that it would make sense, especially I remember the dirt house my grandparents would have brought up in easily for a scorpion to come and hide somewhere in the dark. And by the time you light the deer, you can't sweep because if you go to sweep, you might put yourself in danger by even raising him from, from his layer, which he chose for the night. So if you look at it from a, a sociologic perspective, it made sense. But always, and you find, to maintain a tradition, religions as well as cultures ascribe a religious meaning to that, which should have been now tacking on the Religions give the basis to believe. Exactly. Let's look at Islam. Um, now, I remember growing up having Muslim friends saying that, well, when somebody dies in their family, they would have to bury them within 24 hours. But what was the reason for that, I remember asking. And it was like, well, no, you have to reach there at a certain time because the angel graveyard will come and sit and you would have to sit up and they'll actually make the grave in a particular way for the body to sit up. Um, but where, when I grew up and started looking at comparative religion and comparative cultures, where did um, Semitic religion, which is Christianity, Judaism, and Islam come from? It came from the desert. How are you going to keep a body with no refrigeration, no electricity, for 24 hours? It had a public health purpose. Mm -hmm. You had to bury the body so it wouldn't decay and cause disease within the community. Now, you see, it had a, it had a, it a, a public health... Religious, a religious meaning it, Exactly. Yeah. Um, another thing is the, the, the swine. Um, if you really look at some point within the history, the meat of the pig wasn't eat, eat, didn't eat it for a public health reason. It's because there was a disease that was being spread mm -hmm. from the porcine meat mm -hmm. to the humans. So a public health decree was made that we shouldn't eat it, and it's haram. Um, circumcision. In a desert-going place where water is not available, to basically have a foreskin would be unhealthy because you, 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 you're, you're increasing the chances mm -hmm. of you getting infection. So if you really look at it, there was a, indeed a purpose for it, but slowly and slowly over time, as it changed, we forgot. But in Hinduism, do we have these things also? Yes, we also have these things because, I mean, I mentioned Ashwamed. Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned the fact of certain traditions that we would practice, Chutihar. You know that expression? Yes, <laughs> impure. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now, that was a public health reason because mm -hmm. at the end of the, at that time, you also, now the most prevalent and... Up now, I think they still practice that. If someone dies in a home, nobody wants to eat in your home. Right. Now, if you were to look at the causes of death then versus now, Mm -hmm. Because of that now is heart disease and cancer and non-communicable diseases. Mm -hmm. That is not infectious. But back then, people used to die in their 30s and their 40s from infectious disease. Mm -hmm. Looking at it from a medical perspective, in, infectious disease would, would have started first. Today, my discussion with Dr. Visham Bimal, he is a very important issue of Inarrival Day. Some of his superstitious beliefs in, in, uh, amongst men, generally speaking, and we are saying we have to identify the rituals may be there, but they outlive their purpose, as you said. We'll continue discussion in a short while. It's time to get interactive. interactive. Introducing interactive. ITV's People Report, the place where you tell us your concerns. Highlight your issues within your community and let us help you. You call our newsroom at 222-0108 or 222-6177 or email us at itvnews1 at gmail.com. You can also connect with us on Facebook, ITV News Trinidad and Tobago. We'll hear your concerns and let your voice be heard. ITV's People Report, where your opinion matters. Welcome back, viewers, to our program, Let's Talk. Today in studio is Dr. Visham Bimal. We are discussing some beliefs and practices of Hinduism. We reach the point where you use the term Chutihar. What does that mean? What is the implication of that? <laughs> well, I remember growing up when there's a death in the family. Usually it said you shouldn't eat um, from the house of the dead, right? Well, I mean... The explanation was for ghosts and spirits and all these kinds of things. But I was making the point that back then, um, the cause of death was usually an infectious cause. And for public health reasons, again, that was made so that there wouldn't be much, it was kind of a quarantine with respect to people being exposed to what that person would have died from. And after a certain period of past, 
then you could probably go back to the house and, and partake of meals. So again, a sociological reason that makes sense now have a religious tact on it well, we'll to believe the it. propagation yeah. of the culture. We'll go on to another one of the beliefs of our Hindu people. There's, and it may be mystified, some people are afraid of it. There are a lot of misconceptions. Kali Puja. Yeah. I remember going to present at a conference in Guadeloupe. Um, now, I know Kali worship is prevalent in Trinidad, but it's more so prevalent in these countries. Um, and it's one practice of Hinduism that is not mainstream as Sanatanis, which are most of the Hindus. And I remember asking the question to one of the person of Tamil origin, in other words, they came from that part of India, where the indented laborers would have come and asked them, well, is this still practiced in India? Um, and the answer was no, it's not practiced anymore, because people have grown to appreciate the, it's not needed anymore because of the philosophical and understanding of human beings at that point, but it is still practiced in the villages which is the same as if you would look at the uh, Bhojpuri diaspora here in Trinidad. A lot of what we do, even though we would have achieved and moved up the social ladder and it may not have any significance anymore, we still stick to that village way of understanding how we exist and uh, making sense of mm -hmm. what we have to do as Hindus. So um, just to put it in perspective, uh, in the early part of indentureship, uh, that would have been from the 1830s all the way to the 1870s. A great bit of indentured laborers came from Bihar. At that time, the British still had Calcutta as its capital, so it, people from UP and uh, UP didn't really come at that point. Um, as well as 10% coming from now Tamil Nadu, which was Madras back then. And if you if you look at where that early period in countries where indentured laborers indentured um, labor would have started, which would have been Mauritius, Trinidad, and Guyana. You, they would have taken those Tamils or Madrasis from the villages where this type of animal sacrifice worship would have been practiced. And it's still, just like how we stick to our traditions in the Sanatanis faith, that still is, resembles what the, the village part of UPB Har looks like. It's the same thing that happened to that particular South Indian diaspora in Trinidad, in Guyana, in Mauritius, and if you were to look at the diaspora in Martinique and in Guadeloupe, the, the French, unlike the British who had their largest stock from North India, mm -hmm. the, large, the most of the Indians from those colonies, in the French colonies, came from Pondicherry, which would have been the southern part of India. So that aspect you speak of, Kali worship, is actually the main type of Hinduism practiced in those as to our So ancestors colonies. who came on Indian ship, they brought this Kali Puja with them, or this came afterwards? This would have come in the earlier parts of indentureship, mm. where the people of, uh, from Madras, for, well, it's not Madras today, but Tamil Nadu, mm. would have been Madras in the, during the British uh, colonial times in India, mm. brought that tradition from that particular With the open sacrifice for animals yes, and so on. Yeah, yeah. But now they have changed and some people are doing Kali Puja, not with animals. Right, not with animals, they actually do it. Uh, I remember growing up though, because I grew up in a Brahmin family, my uncle was a pundit, Questioning about this. Now, in the Hindu tradition, whenever you do a Devi worship, you offer some sort of sacrifice. Now, he was saying that, yes, you look at the offer of sacrifice as an animal within the, the Kali worship tradition, but in the Sanatana tradition, he said, you know, we do a sacrifice too. I was like, no, another way of it is like, that's why you put the coconuts. Correct, yeah, substitute. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, but it's not really a substitute. Not a, not a substitute, no, no, no. But yeah. Yeah. it's a representation yeah. of that sacrifice. Yeah. So, um, even though you might probably look, in truth and in fact, yes, I would use the term substitute, but it's really the traditions changing in such mm -hmm. a way to be more relevant mm -hmm. to our understanding of ourselves, nature, and our intellectualism at the point of where we reach. Now, if you were to look at human civilization, human civilization did go through all these aspects because earlier human civilization practiced human sacrifice as part of, all kinds exactly. of yeah, yeah. Um, even there's reference to it in the earlier scriptures of the Hindus where they mm -hmm. looked at animal sacrifice mm -hmm. as part of worship. But it changed over it time. Evolved. It yeah. has evolved over yeah. time. And I remember we spoke about the Vedas and looking at our scriptures from the point of 
Shruti and Smriti. Mm. From Shruti to Smriti, you actually see a developmental process mm. over how man's understanding of himself, God and nature has evolved over time. In sync, yeah. yeah. Now we have another belief at practice in Trinidad. The, we have normal devotees, Durga, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Vishnu, Shiv, and we have Dibhava. What is your research on Dibhava as far as you're concerned through your studies? Now, I want to bring it before I come to that in a broader perspective. They say that Vedic knowledge is abstract knowledge. In mm -hmm. other words, it tells of a time and place that is no longer relevant to where we live, so you may not understand. It actually speaks of a geography in which we do not live. Whereas, if you look at indentured laborers, they wouldn't really look at David, know about David, mm -hmm. but they would more refer to Ram Charitramanas or Mahabharat. Mm -hmm. um, because it takes that Vedic essence and gives it form in a story. Now, if you look at education, we would give a child. Versus education, we'll give an adolescent. Mm -hmm. Versus education, we give an adult. It's not the same. It actually tailored to the way in which each stage of human development would understand. In the same way, the practices, as I explained in the Vedas, would have changed over time. Now, the Vedas itself speak of Rudra. It speaks of Varuna. It speaks of Surya. It speaks of Ratri. And it calls natural phenomena God. Mm -hmm like a child would understand. And then after, it took those natural phenomena and personified them. So knowledge, which is an abstract concept, became known as Saraswati, which was a goddess. So it took what was not form and created form, because the human mind understands within the context of form. Again, within a story, within the human experience. And then it goes on now to, 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 to venerate one as above the other, and then switch. So it went from polytheism into pantheism into monotheism, which is what we understand to be Semitic religions like Christianity mm -hmm. and Islam. And then it goes to monism, evolution of human thought expressed in the understanding of who God is, where it tells now in the Upanishads or the concluding part of the Vedas, after seeing God in nature, then seeing God in nature as personified, then venerating one form above the other, then saying, oh no, all is one, and then say, no, that one is indeed who you are. So as far as you can see, beyond the stars, everything that you see doesn't really exist there, but it exists within you. So it tells of human thought. The Dibaba concept is the concept of, of the house. Um, and it's not even something that's specific to Hinduism. Even the Orisha practice it. They call him Saint Job. But is Dibaba uh, indigenous to Hinduism? Um, or no? If you really look at... Hinduism itself, Hinduism is not really from one pure form that was corrupted over time. Mm. Hinduism actually resulted from the migration of different peoples into so India. It, my thoughts go back to D is not even a Hindi word. Uh, what's, your, <laughs> what's your understanding of it? D? A, B, C, D? <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you go back to, to, to village India or the times when... Uh, because remember, the whole Vedic stories themselves, if you look at the geography within the Rig Veda, it doesn't mm. talk about uh, geography within India. It talks about um, just where Afghanistan and all these other places are, where the, in, where the Saraswati River was. It talks about that. It talks mm. about where Punjab yeah, is. Why you, yeah, yeah. Right. And then when you look at the Atharva Ved now, that talks about a landscape within the Gangetic Plain. So it talks mm. about a migration. Um, and even the sound systems within the Sanskrit changes, mm. like Arna, Arna doesn't exist in Rig, it only mm -hmm. started to exist in the Atharva, which is the later mm -hmm. part. So it means that there were meeting of people. And at one point in India, there was the concept of the village deity, or the deity that mm -hmm. resides over the village and protects the village. And that's where the concept of D comes from, where you think that a house or a household is protected mm -hmm. by a residing deity. Now, it depends on the understanding of people with respect to that. If you want to understand God as one manifestation of the protector of your house, one manifestation of the protector of your village, one manifestation of the protector of the entire earth. Now, it depends on the level of understanding of people with respect to how they relate to the world. Now, if somebody does the puja, I have no way to tell them a world. You know, you don't have so to. That's do, so right. They do that. whatever they feel they want to do. Want to keep in, in line with philosophy and Hinduism. Exactly, but again, it comes back to us, or at least the Hindu community now, bringing that understanding of what was practiced mm -hmm. 
So mm -hmm. what is relevant now? Now we have a shortage of time, so we let's give these some issues again which affect the Hindu community. Now, apart from these things like the Baba and practicing of Kali Puja in a way which is not, you know, sometimes different, we have certain challenges facing the Hindu community. We have, for instance, many Hindus and Indians think that lesbianism, gays and so on doesn't affect us. What is the, your view or Hindu view of I mean, how we go about addressing these issues? Bear in mind we have young people coming up. I'm not condoning, not criticizing, but there are issues, are real life issues we have to face in the Hindu community, in the Indian community. Um, looking at it from the Hindu scriptures themselves, um, this is not a new concept. Mm -hmm. The only reason it seems like a new concept because it's more openly spoken about. Mm -hmm. um, it existed even in the time of ancient India itself. Mm -hmm. um, my own personal view is that just like we were talking about D and just like we were talking about understanding God in mm -hmm. multiple forms mm -hmm. versus understanding God within oneself, it all depends on the person's understanding because in, and, and again it goes back to identity within the theme of, um, within the theme of Indian Arrival Month. Mm -hmm. This is also an issue of identity mm -hmm. because in some cases from a medical standpoint, um, it's not a matter of a disease. It's not a matter of something's wrong with the person. They truly believe, and it comes to belief again, where even though you're born with XY chromosome, you believe you're XX. Mm -hmm. Or if you're born with XX, you believe you're XY. Um, and it's something where, whenever you talk about identity of a person, you talk about deep within the psyche. And to basically delve into that is, to me, taking extra effort. Because if you understand yourself to be a particular way and the other person understands himself to be a particular way, there's no reason why you can't coexist. But the Indian community, Hindu community should actually look at this, have discussion, and move forward constructively based on religion, I suppose. Based on religion. rather criticize or condemn or say but, yes or no. But just like even the issue of sex, where you'd find in a traditional Indian home, it's not openly discussed. No. And it's something that we need to look so at. You have because started because now they say in marriage, which is based upon sex, basically, you must be over 18. Right. So we have started this question, I think. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it really shows in a positive way. But again, we also have to look at ourselves and the views in which we uh, would approach it. Because a lot of time, and again, coming back to Indian Arrival, Indian Arrival Month, which is something we need to explore, is how has colonialism really affected our psyche and understanding? A lot of the concept of um, gays and lesbians we understand unconsciously from a biblical standpoint. And the education system which we had referred to before comes from that standpoint. Today, I'm in a discussion with Dr. Vishan Bimal on some very important issues concerning inner arrival, the Hindu community, some of the practices, some of the things that obtain in the Hindu community, whether it is acceptable or not, we are not part of any judgment in it. We are saying these are issues which the Hindu community has to face. Today, I'd like to thank very much, Dr. Vishan Bimal, for being here and sharing your idea and thoughts with us. Indeed, a man of wearing many hats. We appreciate very much what you have done and shared with us today. Once again, viewers, this is the end of the program. Until next time, see you around.